Hello, and welcome to guests joining in from around the world for this British Museum event, Concepts of Cosmos in the World of Stonehenge, in which our speakers will develop aspects of the World of Stonehenge exhibition showing until the 17th of July 2022. I'm Jill Cook, Head of the Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory. I have the pleasure of presenting and joining in discussion with two leading experts on the archaeology of Europe from 6,000 to 3,000 years ago. Basically, this is the time of the spread of far the first farming communities across Europe and the later dissemination of metalworking in gold, copper and bronze. As you will hear, these economic transformations also brought far reaching changes in ideas, beliefs and ways of life. Talking about this in relation to Stonehenge, we have Professor Tim Darville of Bournemouth University. Tim has worked at and around Stonehenge for the last 20 years and will share his knowledge of the site and perhaps his latest ideas, some of which you may have seen previewed in the press this week. Tim will be speaking after Professor Harold Meller, Director of the State Museum of Prehistory and the Department of Heritage Management in Ar Archaeology for Sachsen Anhalt in Germany. The British Museum is so grateful to Harold, who in our, enabled the marvellous partnership between London and Halle, which has underpinned the development of two related, interrelated, but separate exhibitions for a very challenging period of time. His support and that of his excellent team epitomise the importance and value of collaborations across borders that enrich a common appreciation of the deep past. Harold is going to talk first about the Nebra Sky Disc, a centrepiece of the exhibition. It is uh, 4,600 years old and because of its beauty and what it shows about the connected territories of Europe, and perhaps beyond, it is an outstanding loan to the exhibition, exemplifying one of its major themes and providing one of its lead images. Harold, if you would please um, put your presentation on while I just say to our audience, um, I'm sure you will have questions um, if they occur to you during the course of the lecture or just afterwards. Please do put them, write them into the Q&A section. And after a little bit of, of discussion, we'll try and get to as many of your questions as we can. You can help us if you go, if you see in the question and answer session, section um, a question which is similar or the same as the one you have, just put a thumbs up by that and we'll know what the most popular questions are and try to get to those in particular. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Harold to start off telling us about the world of the Nebra Sky Disc, New Horizons. Thank you, Harold. Thank you very much. Nice to invite me. Thank you very much. And we are very happy to show the Nebra Sky Disc in the British Museum now. And I think you should all come to see the original. But now we start with the image. The Nebra Sky Disc is one of the most important archaeological finds in the world. It has been part of the UNESCO memory of the world since 2013. There are total 24 entries in Germany, including Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. This show you how important the Nebra Disc is. The Sky Disc is and its accompanying finds were illegally discovered in 1999 by two looters in southern Saxony Anhalt. After police investigations, I was able to meet the illegal antiquities dealer in Basel. 
in a police-led sting operation. They were arrested at the Basel police. Here we can see the condition of the sky disk and its accompanying finds in February 2002 after they had arrived in Germany and you see that some things are broken during the police thing. Uh, confessions and statements of the looters as well as various scientific analyses enabled the exact reconstruction, reconstruction of the deposition of the sky disk. What you see here is one of the looter and a plastic sky disk where we try to reconstruct the original uh, find spot. The careful archaeological excavation and examination of the robbery hole also helped to understand the deposition exactly here. The black uh, dot is the robbery hole. Evidence for the authenticity of the find spots are, for example, matching metal analysis of the sky disk and the soil of the feature, forensic analysis of the Hatturian soil and the finds, so that we know today that the sky disk and the accompanying finds are coming from this robbery hole. The sky disk was changed five times, thereby its meaning also changed. This covered a period of about 200 years. Originally, the sky disk was not green, it, which is uh, only a product of corrosion, but black as the night, as you can see here. Images of stars and the night sky are known from antiquity, but always in a mythological form, as on the ceiling of the tomb of Pharaoh Osetos I. In contrast, the sky disk is only modern looking, sober is the only modern looking sober representation of the night sky. The cluster of seven stars probably present the Pleiades as well known calendar stars. In the first phase of the sky disk, a leap rule is depicted, the conjunction of the Pleiades with the crescent moon. In order to bring the lunar and the solar year into harmony, it is necessary to insert a leap month when the Pleiades stand near a four-day-old crescent moon in spring, as depicting on the sky disk. This is the case every third year, which approximately compensates for the difference of eight day, eight, 11 days per year. This rule is mentioned in more texts, more recent texts of Mesopotamia, so the so-called Mulapin texts. The knowledge of the leap rule was probably already known in Mesopotamia in the early 2nd millennium BC, which raises the question who, whether it reached Europe from thereby long distant contacts. In the second phase, two golden arcs are added to the sides. This refers to knowledge about the course of the sun that had already been known over 2000 years at the time of the sky disk. Some Neolithic enclosures here, Gosek, not far from Nibra, show the same orientation to summer and winter solstice, which applies also to younger Stonehenge. The golden arcs represent the areas on the horizon where the sun rises and sets in the course of the year. The terminations thus shows the points of sunrise and sunset at the solstices. In phase three, the golden arch is added in the lower area representing a ship. You see here this golden ships of the Nordic Bronze Age. In the Nordic Bronze Age, a myth has been tangible since about 1600 BC, in which the sun is transported through day and night on a ship. The sky disk, which is the, which its depiction of ship, could be an early Central Europe precursor of this idea. The myth of transporting the sun on a ship probably originated in Egypt, where it's frequently documented. 
In a recently discovered depiction below right, you can see this, there are also curved chips similar to the depiction of the sun disk. In the fourth phase, the sky disk was perforated at the edge. Possibly it was mounted on a standard similar to Scandinavian examples and presented to the public. In phase five, the left horizon arc was probably removed before the sky disk was ritually deposited. Excuse me. The sky disk was deposited with two swords, two axes, a chisel, and two arm spirals dating the find around 1600 BC. The sky disk shows influences from many regions. The copper, for example, comes from the Eastern Alps. Maybe most important is that the gold and probably also the tin came from Cornwall. The Damascene technique probably originates in the Aegean. As we saw, the leap rule could have its origins in the Middle East, while the myth of the sunship probably came from Egypt to Europe. And we do have Hench monuments dating to the third millennium in central Germany, the region of the sky disk as well. Possibly they share the same ideas with the ones from Britain. Near the village Pömmelde in saxony anhalt we found we find first circular exclosures of the Bellbeaker culture, was completely excavated and can contribute substantially to a better understanding of Stonehenge. Both sites show close connections which is clear from the similar ground plans and the most uh, most almost identical diameter. You see here in blue and yellow. Yellow is uh, on the graph Stonehenge and blue is Pemelte. And you see that the ditches and the structures are nearly from the same diameter and the same form. So it, they are made by the same people, the Belbica people, so that we think there's a very close connection. In Pömelte, shaft pits with cultic deposits, you see his human sacrifices, including human sacrifices of women and children were found, dug into the ring ditch about almost about two meters deep. Since 2018, we excavating the settlement south of the enclosure, you see here the enclosure and the settlement, and it turns out that the largest settlements of the rising early bronze age is in Central Europe, is here near Permelde on the fringes of the Imperium of Aunitids. What kind of society settled in Permelde and later on produced the sky disk? At the top of the society were princes. They were buried in elaborately constructed and richly furnished, furnished burial mounds, as well known samples from Leubing and Helmsdorf can show you. Apparently, the princely rank was demonstrated by fixed gold regalia, a kind of a dress coat with golden arm rings, pin and hair rings, the composition of which was handed down precisely over generations. You can see here the missing graves between, but you can see that the regalia of the different graves are totally the same. A similar social structure probably existed in the Wessex culture in southern England, which also knows rich princely tombs, such as the grave from Bushborough, shown here, which is near Stonehenge. A few years ago, the largest non burial mound of the Bronze Age in Central Europe, not so big as Silver Hill, but nearly which once measured 65 meter in diameter was excavated southeast of Halle. The inner store core, stone core contained a wooden burial chamber built from oak logs like we know from the princely mount of Leubingen. The mount itself was probably whitewashed 
like it's known from England as well. And this is very unusual for our region. It's normal in South England because you have this chalk, but to put chalk on a grave mound is very, very unusual and a very close connection for us in Germany. The burial chamber was empty. It was obviously robbed before. Maybe the richest gold hoard from this period found nearby, end of the 19th century, originally belonged to the Prince of the Bornhoek. And you see here this golden X, and this is very special because if you go into the British Museum, you see gold weapons, but you found the gold weapons of Ur or something like this only from the Near East and not from Central Europe. And this showed you the, the power they wanted to demonstrate to us. Uh, in one moment, please. Yeah. Okay. In any case, it don't work, it don't go on. One moment, the connection broke down with the last picture. Yeah, okay. In any case, in the early Bronze Age of Central Germany existed a steep social hierarchy which with princes on the top. The only Titsi and the Wessex culture which maintained contacts with each other probably even formed a kind of coalo coalition that controlled the exchange of, for example, tin and amber with the Mediterranean. The sky disk represents a product of this strongly connected world and probably ultimately serve to legitimize and secure power for the elites. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, a bit of dialogue going on in the studio here, but I hope everybody's following us. We're going to talk a little bit about Stonehenge. And I have to say that it's a great pleasure to be sharing this meeting with, with Harold Meller and to be able to do this connection between the things that he's been talking about in Germany and what I'm now going to be talking about for a few minutes down at Stonehenge in Britain. We're going to build on what Harold's been talking about. And if anything, we're going to take ourselves back in time a little bit because Stonehenge starts a little bit earlier than some of the things that we've been talking about so far. We're going to talk a bit about the cosmology of Stonehenge. And as Jill said in her original introduction, I'm going to say a little bit about the Stonehenge calendar, which has been in the news quite a bit uh, over the last few days. So let's just start off by recognizing that Stonehenge is a complicated monument. It's a long lived monument. We're going to explore something of the changes go on there. The important thing is that Stonehenge starts as a large earthwork enclosure. We can see the plan here on the left hand side of the screen. And that enclosure has a northeastern entrance, which has an orientation of about 44 degrees east. Now, that's not an orientation that takes us to any solstice alignments or anything particularly interesting in the sky, but it does seem to take us to interesting things on the land. And we can see that on the map on the right hand side with the phase one axis heading towards the River Avon, it goes across the Cursus and separates out the landscape. Now, at this time, of course, Stonehenge is a cemetery. It's used as a cemetery, and there's, there's lots of burials being discovered there. There's pits, and burials are cut into those pits and into the bank and into the ditch. The bit which we are perhaps most familiar with as Stonehenge is the Stonehenge Phase 2. Technology is really lending us down here. There we go. Um, Stonehenge Stage 2, which is when we start to see the stones being constructed in the center of the monument, sometime around about 2,600 through to about 2,400. And here's a representation of, of what some of those stones at that time would have been like. When we see the dates for these phases, we do just have to remind ourselves that it's easy to take the earliest date and think that's when it happened. But the reality is that things in this stage could have happened any time between 2,600 and 2,480. Um, so we just have to take these broader date brackets rather than trying to fix individual very precise dates to them. Now, during this phase, Stonehenge is realigned. The earthworks are changed slightly and we have a principal axis established, which is now 
on an orientation of 49 degrees east, which does take us to the northeast and the midsummer sunrise, and it takes us to the midwinter sunset if we look down towards the southwest. Now that, as you'll see, is about five degrees difference from the phase one monument. And it's at this point that the sun becomes really important in what's going on. Lots of people have looked for other alignments here. There's been attempts to try and get um, some lunar alignments embedded into this monument too, but there's nothing that shows very strongly there. The only other one that we can look at and see um, a little evidence of is what we often refer to as the secondary axis, which is towards the midsummer sunset and the midwinter sunrise. And Tim Dorr has noticed that that um, alignment, that orientation, crosses the primary axis in the form or in the representation of the big trilithon at the southwest. And you can see where the two arrows on my diagram cross, and there's that big trilithon there. And the angle is about 80 degrees. Now, if you remember back to Harold's talk just a few moments ago, he showed us a very similar diagram for the, for the Nebra disk, and there was an angle just a little bit more than that, 81, I think it was, degrees and this is 80 here. That's because we're a little bit further north for the reason that we have this intersection between the solstitial alignments to the midsummer and midwinter sunrise and sunset. Now, this is the basis of the cosmology. It's not the cosmology itself. It's what people are developing. And of course, we have to work this through, not just at the monument itself, but in the landscape around about it and recognize that when Stonehenge is being built in this way, a lot of other things were happening in the landscape, including the development of the cursus that was being recut. It was a much older monument, but it was being recut at this time. Durrington Walls was being built. And just a little bit later, the avenue was added onto Stonehenge to perpetuate this solstitial alignment deeper into the landscape. But the focus, of course, of all of this was very much the sun. And the sun is the main theme. And I think if you go around the British Museum exhibition, one will see that as you come into the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age, the sun is very, very much the theme of the objects that are on display there and the story that's told. And we have to set that into the wider context, which Harold has already started to introduce us to, which is the rise of solar cosmologies. And in Northwest Europe, they are predominantly um, taken around and developed and, and experienced by bell beaker cultures and by corded ware cultures. And in the Stonehenge landscape, we've got a beautiful example of this with the Amesbury Archer's grave. You see it there, and you can see many of the objects on display in the exhibition. It dates to the period around about 2,500 to 2,400 BC. The artifacts show us some incredible linkages down into Spain and into the west of France, and the geochemistry of the Amesbury Archer himself allows us to say that he was born and brought up in the Alps and moved to southern Britain sometime later. So we have the context for this, that there is the spread of ideas. We have the spread of solar cult, solar ideas related to cosmologies, and we see it very strongly in the earliest objects of the early Bronze Age. Here we see, for example, some of the sun disks which are on show in the exhibition. It starts with a nice stone example there from Denmark. We've got stone examples from the British Isles too, not quite as elaborate, but we have them. And we've got some very nice gold sun disks there from, from Ireland and from Wales and from England. And if you look very closely, especially at the ones from Ireland and England, you'll see that those crosses don't meet at 90 degrees. They are a little bit off. They're not quite 80 degrees, but they're not 90 degrees either. And so they're beginning to understand a little bit of this relationship of the way that the things cross in the landscape. Well, we might reasonably ask ourselves at this point why it is that we need solar cosmologies. What are cosmologies all about? We used it in the title of this whole session. Cosmologies are all about people structuring the way they live. They think about a structure to the universe. They think about the place of people within it. They try to give meaning and ideas which relate to creation myths. They tell us about where we came from. They account for how people are descended from ancestral beings, for example. And they try to establish relationships between people and the world around them, particularly that obvious connection between birth and life and death. And perhaps more than anything else, they try to map out the passage of time, 
people's relationship to time, people's relationship to the heavens, to the gods, to all the other things which are going on around them. And it's in that connection that Stonehenge has, we believe, I believe, and I've pointed out the evidence just in the last few days, uh, has embedded in it essentially a calendar. And that calendar is there to help the people at the time develop their rituals. Well, the idea of Stonehenge and a calendar, or Stonehenge having a calendar, is actually nothing particularly new. Uh, people have been talking about it for a very long time. This is just um, three individuals from the 20th century who have spoken about it quite a lot. But none of their proposals actually worked. None of them actually offered us a calendar which really did anything. There was lots of good ideas, and many of them tried to um, embed both the solar and lunar aspects of a calendar in what they say, but it didn't really work. And it's only when we started to understand the dating of Stonehenge better, and perhaps just as importantly, understand that the source of the sarsen stones was a common set of outcrops or set of deposits up near Marlborough, which had been exploited and brought down to, to Stonehenge in a single uh, single source, giving rise to that set of the monument, um, that we started to see that maybe the Sarsons are all about what's going on here. And when we look at the Sarsen structure, we see that it's got some nice features to it. There are a series of key elements to it. We've got the outer Sarsen circle of 30 stones. We've got an inner setting of trilithons, five trilithons, each with a pair of stones. And then we've got four stones around the outside. And we can multiply up the elements here to give us a very nice, a very elegant, a very simple and a very straightforward, but very much a working calendar. A working calendar of solar years based on 365 and a quarter days, solar days in the solar years. So the Sarsen circle of 30 uprights gives us 12 months each of 30 days, 360 days. The trilithons give us an intercalary month of five days, which adds on to that. And the station stones give us a nice uh, set of, of quarter days, if you like, which we would call leap days around the outside. So these things together um, fit quite well, but there's there's more detail than that that we can add to it because these um, months, if we're right, the 30 uprights forming the, the month are themselves subdivisible. And if we look, there are two rather curious stones. It's stone 11 and stone 21. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see stone 10 on the left-hand side and then stone right with the ranging rod against it on the left-hand side. And I think you agree it's a rather different kind of stone. It's lost a little bit of the top, I'm afraid, but it is a narrower and thinner stone. And then when we look across a bit further around the circle, on the left-hand side there, we've got stone 21 on the left with the ranging rod against it and stone 22, which is the normal size stone uh, adjacent. And it's got its lintel across the top in this case. Now that um, is an interesting pattern because it subdivides the circle of 30 into three groups of 10. And that perhaps provides us with rather a nice model of a month based on three weeks each of 10 days separated and marked by these rather different kind of stones. And if, if we look at other aspects of it, we'll see, we can see similar sorts of things going on there. So how might this work in, in practical terms, as it were? Well, New Year's Day on this arrangement would be the place where the sun starts to move on the horizon at the sunset. That winter sunset point is the architectural um, focus of the whole of Stonehenge. And when the sun starts to move at the end of the winter solstice, that's New Year's Day. Now, in our proleptic Gregorian uh, calendar that we use today, that interestingly enough would be Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And that would be the start, that would be the New Year's Day in the Neolithic calendar. Then we would go round and round and round 12 times through the cycle of the 30 upright stones, and we would come to the end of those 12 months, and we would start the intercalary month of five days, which is the festival of Yule, and would coincide with the winter solstice. Along the way, as it happens, in month six, day 29, we would get the beginning of a summer solstice festival. In traditional terms, that's the festival of, of Lither. Um, but the Yule festival is the one which spans the New Year period. As we come back into Yule, the, summer, the midwinter sunset, 
the solstice there is the new year festivities and we go round and round again adding in adding in an extra day every four years to give us the uh, leap year which has the effect of keeping this perpetual calendar absolutely in sync with the seasons we have to remember though that with prehistoric calendars um, the people who are administering them can um, exercise a little bit of uh, judicious reworking now and again and just like today somebody announces on on new year's eve that they're going to add a few seconds to the clock before the new year starts so in the neolithic i think they would have added uh, a little bit of time here and there just to make it all fit together and fit together smoothly so we've got a proposition which works and it works with the sarsen setting at stonehenge which i think is rather good we might ask ourselves though what about the origins of this kind of calendar well it's certainly possible that people develop this up here in uh, northwestern Europe and we've got lots of other stone circles of course around the place and, and other circular monuments that uh, that might be right but sites like this Mary Maiden stand in Cornwall don't have the requisite number of stones uh, and of course the stones are very different I think we have to recognize and perhaps sometimes we rather forget that Stonehenge is a totally unique monument its construction, the way it's constructed, and the quality, if you like, of the construction is quite different from anything else that we see around in Northwest Europe at this time. And so perhaps we have to look further afield. And rather, as Harold was saying, with his connections from Germany and that part of Europe, we might be looking towards the Mediterranean for some of these links. And as we've already said, the Belbica cultures have a foothold in the Mediterranean. If we go back to the map we were just looking at, we also have to remember that further east, we're talking about the emergence of the Old Kingdom, as it's called, in Egypt, dynastic Egypt. The Old Kingdom starts around about 2650 or so BC. And by 2500 BC, people have really developed their solar cults and people refer to their ruler, for example, as being the son of Ra, the son of the sun. And um, down on the bottom right hand side there you've got a little bit of actually a little bit later but it doesn't matter it shows the uh, scene rather well there we've got some of the deities with their sun discs on their head and the sun is so important that it shows in this kind of way and we recognize this kind of tradition so we might ask you know why do we need a calendar i mean if stonehenge has got that embedded in his architecture just as many other temples and structures do in more recent times why on earth do we need a calendar well, the principal reason is, in a sense, to control the routine of everyday life, but maybe not necessarily the everyday life of everybody, but certainly ways in which they can please the gods and have these calendarized festivals and ceremonies which link people's routines with the routines of the deities. It's often a way that uh, political elites legitimize their power. Sometimes people say, well, who makes time makes power, and that's, that's certainly a phenomena in many societies. It gives substance, of course, to the kind of conceptual cosmologies that we were talking about uh, a few minutes ago. It structures behaviors, it structures relationships. These are important things too. And if anything, it brings communities closer to their gods by ensuring that events happen at propitious moments, particularly for things such as healing rituals and times when you really need the gods help to sort out what's going on. It also, of course, allows communities to make and mark and keep pace with time and, and compare those times with what's going on elsewhere. Well, I hope that gives us a little bit of an insight into cosmologies relating to Stonehenge. As you'll perhaps have grasped, it's quite a massive topic and we've only had time just to graze into a few things during the course of this evening. Um, but uh, there is an opportunity, as Jill said at the beginning, there's been quite a lot of uh, publicity of that. So read all about it. Um, Antiquity has published a paper on keeping time at Stonehenge, which discusses many of these things. It's free on open access. You can download it at the address that you see on the screen there. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I think um, the two talks that we've heard, and I'm sorry we didn't have time for a little bit of discussion after Harold's, um, or that I, I lost connection for a moment, should I say. Um, uh, is it's fascinating the way they've come together um, but also uh, pose quite serious problems about the 
whole way we review this period. Perhaps if we can bring Harold in as well at this point and just have a little bit of discussion around things. Um, a calendar, and as you've so eloquently both suggested, this is um, about um, deities, power, um, elites, um, and about distant connections. It's you don't need a calendar to know when to sow your crop or uh, when to harvest it. Uh, you can you're close enough to nature in this period to know the soil temperatures improving, things are germinating, the birds are starting to get frisky, and so on and so forth. So for the everyday or ordinary life, a calendar isn't necessary. And yet here we have two calendars um, produced at quite enormous expense, um, not in monetary terms, but in social and economic terms, the erection of the sarsen structures at Stonehenge is an enormous activity which requires surpluses and skills and specialisms and people who are carters and tree fellers and pot makers and surplus food yeah. and, and all that. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. That they are, as you say, massive, massive investments in, in time and travel and the same with, with some of the things that uh, the monuments that, that Harold's got over there. I mean, Part of, part of the thing which fits between us, of course, and, and we're both coming at it from, in a sense, different parts of the archaeological world, but I think we've, we've got a consensus on our general thinking on this because we've talked about it before, and, th and that is that archaeology has been through a period when indigenous development has been very popular. And I think both Harold and I in our presentations over the last few minutes have both recognised that it's time to think more globally. And actually, this, of course, is the theme of the British Museum exhibition, too. We need to think widely. We need to think within the old world as it was. And the beauty of radiocarbon dating is that it allows us to create, if you like, horizons right across the old world when we know, say, 3000 BC, exactly what everybody was doing at that time, independent of the monuments and the artifacts and everything else. We can use radiocarbon to give us these beautiful time horizons which allow us to make comparisons and that I think in Harold's work and in mine has brought us back to an understanding of the fact that there are common themes developing and the sun and the interest in the sun is one of those themes. There are common themes developing over very wide areas. Perhaps Harold wants but, to say something um, too. I, I think we must also um, contemplate, and this is perhaps a question for you both, um, that um, there has to be uh, considerable social buy-in to these, the ideas and the rituals associated with such enormous investment. Um, what we can, but what, what, what we can see in this time is the arising of social complexity. Uh, and uh, we see a strict hierarchy. We haven't this before in this, before the, the, there are tribes and now this is a state-like society. Look at this unbelievable grave of, uh, grave of Bashparo, which gave you a glance what it is possible. For example, this dagger with his golden studs, this is such an enormous effort. This is such an enormous quality. Uh, no king of the medieval times has a similar thing, you know. So. Uh, what 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 we can see is uh, that social complexity goes on go and goes on in the early Bronze Age, and uh, it starts in the late Neolithic, and uh, you must ask why it is possible that one is more than the other. Why is one on the top? Why is one the ruler? What is the legitimation? And the legitimation is not only weapons and power. The legitimation is maybe a personal charisma, but it is also a knowledge the other people not have. And we see in our society now that knowledge is the basis of power. For example, you see this with the computer industry and so on. You're the and uh, information is the basis of uh, of power and what we see that uh, this elites of the Vesex uh, time and the Orneated time <clears throat> this 
elites are very strongly connected and they control the knowledge. And uh, absolutely, I absolutely agree with Timothy that they had strict contacts in the Near East that they know who is the ruler in Egypt. They know who is the ruler in Byblos in the Near East. And this is the basis of the knowledge and they have a special knowledge which is uh, only established in this elite and they use this knowledge and it is uh, a fascinating thing for people if you are able to make a calendar so therefore all our calendars has the name of emperors like uh, the uh, calendar of uh, Gregor the Pope uh, uh, Julius Caesar and so on you know so uh, I think the calendar is, as uh, Timothy said, absolutely right, an uh, instrument of power. And there is an impos- uh, important distinguish between Stonehenge and, uh, 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 and Nibra. Nibra is like the ground plan of Stonehenge. If you make a plan of a little bit more in the south, therefore the angel, uh, angel is another, but it is like the ground plan of Stonehenge but it is a hidden treasure nobody understands. So uh, it is the basis of hidden knowledge. Stonehenge is a knowledge you can understand because it's an official, everybody can see it, you know, every can, every can fo- everybody is able to follow the code. And I'm absolutely happy with the decoding by, by Timothy. I'm absolutely sure that this is the right this is the uh, Stone Age code, you know, and this is very important. Therefore, Stone Age and Nibra are really, really equal, equal, like the DNA of the people is really, really equal, equal. This is a bell peak at early Bronze Age people, but uh, they are relevant, but uh, Nibra is a hidden knowledge. Yeah, that's right. It's a nice evolution. Nibra is a nice evolution onwards from Stonehenge. I mean, it's more than 500 years later i suppose in terms of its its development and it's bringing in the lunar bringing back into it a lunar aspect too which i don't think we see at stonehenge although may well have been part of the calendrical systems before stonehenge i think we've got to recognize stonehenge is part of this this really important and very significant movement within europe of the development of solar cults and um i didn't say as we were going along about the trilithons in the middle we got these wonderful three stone settings, five of them in all. Um, and one of the themes of the solar cults, and uh, again, I think this is reflected in the Nibra deposit, is the so-called divine twins. And the fact that we often find pairs of objects, which are not quite identical, but almost identical, um, put together. And, and this is the case with the stones too. So the deities as divine twins, which obviously we would see later as, as things like Castor and Pollux and um, Artemis and Apollo and so on in, in more recent um, cosmologies, stem somehow from this early Bronze Age period as well. And, and that pair of um, swords buried in with a Nibra disc is perhaps another reflection of that kind of idea. Absolutely. Yes. So would you uh, say that um, we need to uh, reevaluate how we view this period in Europe from something which is... Um, doomed by the word prehistoric um, to uh, something which is uh, much more sophisticated and um, civilized. Um, I suppose they're prehistoric in a the sense they're non-literate um, and they're prehistoric uh, well, in the sense question, before but, history. Uh, but, let me um, finish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, uh, uh, that uh, We uh, should be um, reviewing even a society where there is the potential for coercion and uh, uh, coerc- coercive power. But we also see that as Stonehenge, uh, as we see within in the exhibition, that as Stonehenge um, ceases to be a powerful monument and becomes part of heritage and history of the people of the time we also see a rise in 
in violence and a shift in ritual to depositing things in uh, transitional spaces on the edges of lakes and rivers and so on. Um, well, in, in Britain, that, that um, deposition of things in lakes and rivers comes a little bit later. Um, we're into the sort of Middle Bronze Age before that happens. But, the, but there are changes, you're absolutely right. There are changes going on. Um, I'm not sure that there's a great deal of additional evidence for warfare again until we get another 500 years or so further on. But they, these are fundamental changes to society. And you know, quite yeah. right, we need to think about the social structures and the way that there may or may not be coercion going on. I personally favor things at Stonehenge more being about um, rites of passage and learning and, and getting skilled up in the world. So, for example, the task of moving those stones might be as much about creating the context as a social event for building Stonehenge as it is somebody coercing everybody to go and get stones and bring them and put them into a, the structure that we see. I think there might be some transitional social forms that we have to think about uh, in there as well. What we can see in central Germany is that this time where Stonehenge was built, uh, the time around 2500, 2400, these are these Bellbeaker people and the Cordetware people coming from the steppe as uh, Timothy showed us. And they are warriors, but they are warriors uh, like a warrior elite, not the whole society, not all men are warriors. And so they are, they, they come, maybe they are on horses, they conquered maybe uh, a big part of Europe, and uh, they, uh, especially the Belpica people, had a lot of knowledge. And so also the knowledge is important. You see this on the Amesbury Archer who bring the technology of, of metal from the Alps to South England. And um, all this is important, but at the end of this Belbica period, you have a transition to the early Bronze Age. And the early Bronze Age had not warrior groups in, 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 in Middle Germany, where I, where, where I studied, but they had the first big armies. And the, you can show this on the axis, because in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the Belbica time, everybody has his own X. And in the early Bronze Age, we had X hordes with hundreds of Xs, and all this are cast from maybe one emperor, and they all are cast from the same metal in the same time. And my idea is that he gave it out to the warriors, and not only to elite men, but to normal farmers, to the sons of normal farmers. And so the armies, we can see it are expanding enormously. And this means not war, this means dominance. Because these are so many people with weapons and they are very well structured that uh, the regions around had no chance. So the, what we can see that they dominated, the, they're dominating the north and that the plunder, for example, Scandinavia, all this amber and gold and so on, is coming by, by a plundering system. So what you can see is the first imperialism. What you can see is the beginning of a modern world, which is normal for us, but not normal for Neolithic people, because in the first time of the Neolithic, the people are relatively equal, and uh, they are unequal at the end. and at the really end, in the early Bronze Age, you have a strict hierarchy. And what you see is a development into this direction to more power for single people. And this must be accepted. And this can be accepted if you have a sun god, only one god, and uh, so on. And you have a legitimation by a relation to the, uh, to the god and by a calendar and so on. So what we see is a development to centralize power. And the funny thing is that the end of the early Bronze Age, around 1600, when the Nibra disk is deposited, this, is uh, this system broke into pieces, cut, because maybe there's a revolution or uh, something like this. In the Middle Bronze Age, the people don't accept it and fall back into tribal societies. Uh, so what we see is, uh, in a special way, at the beginning of the modern times with the control of information and the power through information. And therefore, the time of Stonehenge is so important for us to understand 
uh, a development in the direction of our own society in the moment. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It's, it's all about that transition and uh, the emergence of new power, new power questions. And, and in a sense, people's ability to adapt to that changing situation. I do like your idea, Howard, about those, some of those hordes, which have got multiple examples of axes or daggers or swords and things in them, spearheads as well, that um, could be for equipping an elite unit or an army or whatever. And the scale of those, of course, as we know, gets bigger and bigger through the Bronze Age. So our late Bronze Age hordes are absolutely enormous. So yeah, that's a nice, nice uh, proxy for the development of that kind of attitude, that kind of social structure. Um, I'm just waiting now for some uh, some of our first um, questions to come in from our audience. Uh, oh, now they're coming thick and fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't make them too difficult. Um, Um, the first question is, is a good one, and it's something that you'll be able to see within the exhibition if you're able to come. Is, uh, is there other evidence for contact with Egypt and Mesopotamia in Europe uh, at this time? When I said, allowed to say, absolutely, you know. Uh, what we can see are this. Uh, really important blue beads, and these blue beads are made uh, for, uh, 20, 30 years ago. We thought they are made in, in Germany. This is nonsense. Montelius had the idea to say they are made in Egypt. But as Timothy said, the people don't believe in Montelius and all of these old guys from the 19th and early 20th century. In the second time of the 20th century, we think local. And now I think we start to think global again. And mm. now we have to accept that these blue beads, and it is proved by chemistry that these blue beads are coming from Near East and Egypt. They are not from the time of Stone Age directly, because they are around the time of uh, 1450, 1500, two or 300 years later. But the problem is that we, uh, it's always hard to distinguish and find originally imports because the people don't like imports in the time they transform the things and um, one exception uh, is the amber and this is often described by the english colleagues because it's absolutely clear that the amber of the shaft graves is coming from england but south england the Wessex culture but also is coming from the ornithids culture in bohemia and the the tipping point is that uh, this uh, uh, Mycenaean graves was dated very young uh, in uh, the last century and now we know that they are much older and that they fit perfect in our time. So uh, this is really a strong connection and there are more strong connections like the, the, the you have this wonderful hand of prel. And I wrote an article about this hand of Braille. I, I think I can show that this uh, middle Bronze Age hand of Braille is the adoption and the copy of an Egypt or Near East offering hand. You know, and this is fascinating because they they reconstruct the Hittite or Egypt offering hand in uh, a Swiss context. And you, this wonderful hand is in the exhibition, though this is really, only this hand with this golden armoring is a reason to visit the exhibition of Stonehenge in, in your wonderful museum. And if, and if you need a piece which is connecting Stonehenge with the, with the um, eastern part of the Mediterranean, then there's a beautiful glass bead, a red colored glass bead from um, the Willsford Barrow just south of Stonehenge, which is, as Harold says for his, it's a little bit later than Stonehenge itself, but these are the things which are ending up in graves. And by this time, in a sense, it's, it's traditional to make these connections. The very first connections are always going to be very hard to find because there's so little cultural material moving about. But yes, we do. And as Harold says, we've got to go back to some of those beautiful early Bronze Age items and see where they might have been made. Um, the debate's been whether they should be local, and, and there's, there's reasons to think about that very carefully. I remember a very 
well-known phrase by, I think it was Anthony Harding, who said something like, we, we might be arguing about where the sand came from, but the technology definitely comes from the East Mediterranean. You see this, for example, in this wonderful Nebra swords. If you look very carefully on the Nebra swords, you see that they have inlays, metal inlays. In, the, in one of the sort, in the middle is a thing like a snake or something like this. And if you look at Egypt sorts or on the Eastern sorts, you can see the snakes as little inlays in the sort. So what I, what I mean, so the technique is coming from the Near East and from Egypt. This is definitely here. Okay, well, another question uh, we must move on to, but with a quick answer, were there any human remains in Pomalta? Yes, there are human remains in Permelta, a lot of human remains. We have first graves and uh, we have in shafts sacrifices of human beings, only women and uh, only women and child, and they are killed. And the men are buried around them, uh, and uh, but without weapons, the weapons are also deposited in the shafts. And I think this is very important also for Stonehenge. And we work together with the colleagues of Southampton and other colleagues from from England, also Timothy, and we should decode. Uh, uh, Permelte and Stonehenge because uh, the problem in Stonehenge is that you can't excavate huge areas because so many is destroyed in the past. But what we can do, we can excavate Permelte and we can excavate Schönebeck, very similar structures. So maybe with the analysis of these two structures, we understand Stonehenge in future much, be much better. It's a great There's thing to do. There's another question too um, uh, about the two um, sites relating to the ditches and the age of the ditch at Stonehenge and the age of the ditch at Thunder. So perhaps one of you could uh, clarify for the questioner on that. Well, the age of the ditch at Stonehenge is, is, as far as we can reconstruct at the moment, it was constructed around about 2950 BC. There are some earlier objects in the ditch and there is some discussion as to whether they've been brought there from earlier places, earlier sites, if you like, and, and included as special offerings. But the construction of the ditch, as we currently understand it, is around about 2950 BC. How and uh, in, in Stonehenge, uh, in, in Pimmel, the, the ditch is around 2400, 2500, so much younger. But this shouldn't irritate us. We are really, really shocked by another result. When we excavated Pemelde, we find nearby a rectangular holy place, a re rectangular hench, which dated 2,900. And when we excavated Schönebeck, we found the same, exactly the same uh, older monument near Schönebeck. So it means both have a predecessor in uh, which is rectangular. And when I met Josh Pollard uh, in Avebury, they found by uh, geomagnetics a, a really similar rectangular first hench, which is looked like the hen the early henches in, in my country, which are uh, uh, made before this uh, round henches. So it could be that there are more connections than we uh, are able to think and know in the moment. And we shouldn't uh, forget that this uh, Belbica people, which come from Germany or also from my region, come to Stonehenge and they are not new in Stonehenge, so Stonehenge is erected. So what I, I, I can believe is, uh, or I believe is that they see Stonehenge, they go on with uh, changing Stonehenge, but they come back with this knowledge and it could be that what they make in uh, in central Germany is a reflection of Stonehenge. So it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, yes, it comes back from Stonehenge. It could be, we have to clear this in the future. Mm. And, and quite a few of our stone circles in the British Isles do have these central um, square settings, sometimes we refer to them as houses or something of this sort. Um, and indeed, the square in circle is a motif that we find in many of our hinges uh, across the British Isles. Um, another question uh, from our audience is, uh, what is the rationale for identifying gold and other discs 
in the exhibition as sun symbols? Well, I think in a way it's, it's fairly straightforward because they've got the sun drawn on them uh, in the sense of uh, radiating rays and, and spirals and things like that, all the kind of traditional symbols that we have. And, and we know from the East Mediterranean, from Mesopotamia and Egypt, that the circle is, is the symbol of the sun. Um, we see it depicted on the little bit of art that I showed you on one of my slides. This is, this is the standard form. The circle is, is derived from that notion. And perhaps we could go on from there, um, Harold, to ask um, the uh, circle on the Nibra disc. Um, could that be um, the full moon as well as the sun or the sun? The problem is uh, this is an archaeological artifact and we don't know it. So all we do, are, what, 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 all we made are interpretations. But in the moment we see the we see the uh, we see the uh, full circle as sun and as moon. You can see it as both, and uh, also the sickle moon can be uh, a sun during an eclipse. So it's not absolutely sure. But in the moment we say the sickle moon and the full moon, and uh, it symbolizes also the sun. So it's it it is both. What is really important is that. Uh, diameters of the round structures on the sky disk are following a system two, four, six, eight, and so on. So they are in relation to each other. And uh, it's not clear in the moment, absolutely, what does it mean. And uh, the funny thing with the Nibra disk is that we always discovered new things because the techniques, the new techniques are coming up. For example, we are not able to see uh, into the tunnel of this uh, uh, of this second uh, of this second arc, and now we can look in with the microscope and see golden, uh, very tiny golden pieces, so that we know there was a golden arc inside before before they tore it out, and because uh, we don't know if it was from silver or from copper, now we know that it's from gold. I wanted to say that we every year we discovered new things. And uh, this is very thrilling, and the same at Stonehenge. You think every everything <laughs> is done at Stonehenge, but it's not done, you know. So all the time, the uh, colleagues discovered really, really new, uh, new structures and features in Stonehenge, and this is fascinating. Yep. Think what about. We, do know is that we don't know much yes. yet. Yes, Blue Henge and all the other things. Um, uh, possibly a question from Cornwall. Um, could you tell us any more about the, the uh, Cornish gold on the Nibra disc and how you think it may have arrived in Germany or been traded or? Uh, there is a there's a close connection because uh, um, this uh, gold is coming from the first gold is coming from the Karnen River, the second gold because they changed in Nibra. The first gold are the stars and the sun and the full, uh, the full moon. Uh, the next gold is are the horizon arcs. The horizon arcs are also coming from gold from from uh, from Cornwall, we think. It's not absolutely sure, but we are relatively sure. So also this gold is coming from Cornwall. And then the gold of the of the ship is a little bit uh, different, but it could be also from Cornwall. So what is the connection in Cornwall, how it works? The tin is definitely coming from Cornwall. So there is a connection between central Germany and Cornwall, but I think that they don't bring it directly from Cornwall, but over Wessex, because uh, there is a, a typical thing. If you have uh, gold and and uh, other things, you know, never the people are rich at this point. The the neighbors are rich who trade it, and it seemed to be that this Wessex culture. These are the people who control this mountains and the region which is explored uh, with tin and gold. So I think it is coming from from the Wessex system into the Aunitid system. And so I think there's a close connection. You can see this also in the graves at Brittany. There are details, for example, in the graves, the deckers are lying over grass, the, the same like in Leubingen and so on. So there are 
many, many connections. And it is a, a, a really a big luck that we have this one bush barrow grave because it's really, this rich grave shows a strong connection to our princely tombs. I'm absolutely sure that the elites are marrying uh, the, uh, between that they are in a close connection and they know exactly what happened and they control the ways through Europe. You can see this very easily if you make a map of the amber. The amber is coming from the north, but it is absolutely controlled by Wessex and Oniatids and it is only given as a present to friends. And if you look at the Middle Bronze Age, some hundreds of years later, then the amber, it's floating whole Europe. And this means that the people control the trade, the people control the ways. And uh, this is maybe the foundation of an important part of their power, that they uh, have a coalition which is very strong for some hundred years. And the problem is around 1600 when the coalition break down because uh, people at the, at the Polish-German frontier al along the Oder allow an exchange, a direct exchange between Hungary and the north. So the north is rising up, the south is rising up. And the middle and uh, the, this uh, the system of Aunitids and Wessex is going down in the same time. But it held for some hundred years and for, for 400 years, this is the center of power in Central Europe. Yeah, yeah. Trade, is the, trade is the key thing to power and, and having access to what was effectively new resources like gold and copper and tin. These were things which simply weren't used before. So these folk were able to lock into the accessibility and the trading of these new materials. And um, well, they changed society, really. Well, I think on, on that wonderful uh, note about the changing of society, we need to bring things to a close this evening. Um, I have to thank both our speakers very much indeed for um, fascinating and uh, talks which were are hugely relevant to the exhibition, which we hope many of uh, our uh, guests will be able to come and see. Uh, and if not, they've had a marvelous uh, sample of the kind of uh, objects and the, uh, the riches, which are the themes which are displayed within it. So on that note, I'm going to to, to thank you all very much, to let um, people know that uh, on the 10th of March next week, the uh, evening is about ancient DNA in the time of Stonehenge, another hugely relevant and important topic in the exhibition. The speakers are, are uh, Tom Booth and Joanna Brook, uh, and they're moderated by Andrew Fitzpatrick. So I hope as many as you as, poss as possible will uh, join in that uh, uh, meeting next week. Meanwhile, thank you all for joining in. Thank you again to our speakers for such a fantastic evening. I only wish you could hear us um, applaud you in in the pre-COVID way, <laughs> but uh, our our thanks and warmest wishes. Um, uh, are, 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 are offered to you at this point. Thank you very much indeed, and please do enjoy the rest of your evenings. Bye bye. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.